everybody. Um, Bill Horton here. I hope um, you're having a great fall season. I'm going to see if I can get this uh, PowerPoint to open up and go to the full screen. There you go. So this is, um, you know, we did a trail walk in the spring. We did one in early, mid, and late summer. And um, this is the one for the fall. And uh, obviously an incredibly cool time to be here and lots of folks have been around, which has been fun to see everybody. Um, once again, just to put in a quick plug for the uh, North Carolina Arboretum over here on the bottom right, um, I'm just finishing up my um, uh, Blue Ridge Naturalist certification, but there's classes in gardening and all sorts of outdoor stuff, um, nature, climate, uh, all kinds of things, sky watching. Um, you don't have to be in a big um, course. You can just take a single class if you want. So check it out. It's a, it's a great um, resource to us. Um, really a crown jewel of, of um, natural education uh, and a major part of the um, North Carolina University system. So um, what we're going to look at, um, I wandered around the trails and stuff uh, for about uh, six, seven days. And we're going to talk, of course, about fall colors because there's just too much fun going on there to ignore it. <laughs> and then, and then um, we'll dig dig into some of the kind of favorite reds and yellows that are popping up across the valley. Um, you may be familiar with many or, or not so many. Um, and then we're going to talk about a couple of um, interesting uh, fall things that pileated woodpeckers, which are around all the time but begin to be easier to see. Um, and then this um, really bizarre uh, flower called the bottled uh, gentian. And then um, we're going to talk a little bit about hemlock trees um, and something special that we have in the valley and some opportunities that, um, that we have here. So let's um, start off with leaves. And, you know, how is this happening? How are these things um, changing color? What's going on um, uh, fundamentally? And the, probably the most important thing to think about in the beginning is that this is all obviously driven by light and light energy. Um, and the photo period, uh, that amount of time that the plant is exposed to light, is really critical in driving this entire color process in terms of when it starts, how intense it is, and so forth. Um, as the winter comes and the sun begins to shift to the south, the days get shorter, the radiation gets less intense, and that change is what really starts things off. But you'll notice on the top right uh, picture up here, you'll see this um, tulip leaf. And you'll notice there's three different leaves here, different colors, uh, different shades of yellow, and obviously major difference in size. Some of this is very young um, trees versus the more older mature ones, but most of this is the difference between what's called a sun leaf and a shade leaf. And so if you look at any tree, the, the leaves that are in the bottom or are on the shade side, more to the north, um, are going to tend to be larger. They're going to be more like this one in the middle where they're trying to gather light that's less available. Whereas the, the leaves that are out, brilliant uh, exposure in the sun at the top or on the south side will be smaller in general. So when you're looking on the ground and you see different sizes of leaves, it's not always correlated to the genetics of the tree or to the age of the tree. It could be just that you're looking at the difference between a, a sun leaf and a shade leaf. And if you look down here, this is a northern red oak, and you'll see two different um, leaves from the same tree. This one is a sun leaf. It's got more of that bright red color that we'll talk about. Um, this other bigger one has been in the shade. Uh, it hasn't quite gotten as much intense um, light exposure, so the red's a little different tone. So this is some of what begins to set the tone. And if you look in any tree, you'll notice that there's variation. Sometimes there's reds and yellows in the same tree, and we'll discuss how that happens. So I want to just touch on some very simple science, and don't panic about this. It's really obvious and easy, but it's kind of cool to think about. Um, the first thing is that photo period we talked about triggers a situation where the leaf um, is going to cut itself off from its food supply. And the, the fancy word for this is abscission. Um, but basically, if you're at the base of a twig, which would be down here at the base of any twig of a leaf, um, what happens right here at the connection to the uh, stem and the base of the leaf stalk, which is called the petiole, 
you'll see these cells begin to develop and they effectively choke off this fluid channel that is where water is flowing up into the leaf and nutrients um, are flowing up into the leaf while at the same time the sugars and things that the leaf is creating are flowing down the tree. So effectively there's like a, a, a choking off like you would stand on a garden hose and this area right at the base of the leaf stalk begins to harden up. Nutrients can't flow anymore. And so this is what's going to make the leaf fall off when it disconnects down here. But in the meantime, this, this loss of nutrition is what begins to signal and drive all the color changes that we're going to see. Um, you know, some of this is, is affected, of course, by drought during the summer. Um, the colors won't be nearly as intense if it's been a super dry summer or if there's an early freeze and things fall off quicker than would be intended. Um, now, the, the, there's a bunch of chemicals. It's a real complex relationship, but there's really three simple things that happen that are kind of cool. So the, the, the first one, of course, most everybody knows about chlorophyll, which is the green um, chemical that basically makes the leaves look this way all summer. And then the other two characters, um, there's the yellow-orange kind of group that's called uh, carotenoids or carotenoids. Um, you know, you think about carrots and things like that or orange peppers. Um, and we'll talk about what these do. And then the last group are the red ones, which are the anthocyanins. And each of these um, are chemicals or pigments that have a different function. The one thing to remember about the red stuff here, not all leaves have this. Um, all the leaves have chlorophyll in them, and all the leaves have some uh, carotenoids in them. But only certain ones can generate these red anthocyanins, and they can generate them to different levels based on their genetics and stuff. So um, you'll see that difference. And so functionally, you know, what these three pigments are doing is effectively sustaining life on Earth. <laughs> And, and the chlorophyll, as everybody knows, drives photosynthesis. But this is really, you know, an incredible um, process when you think about it because the leaf is basically taking water from the ground and sunlight from the sky and mixing it with carbon dioxide that it absorbs in through the bottom of the leaf, through these little pores in the bottom of the leaf, chews all that up through a bunch of chemical processes and spits out oxygen that it flow, puts back out into the atmosphere through those pores in the bottom of the leaf and then drives all these sugars that is used for the cells to allow the tree to grow and to spread and that's all going to be taken down into the root system as well. Um, this of course is what's driving the entire web of life and um, you know people used to talk about the food chain but that term has kind of gone away now because everybody's thinking of it more as a food web because these sugars that the tree is creating are going to flow back down into the ground and are effectively going to be used by the fungi and everything else in the ground that drives all the other plants and the, both animal and plant life. So that, that's what the green pigment is doing. And during the summer, or all during the year, when you see green on the leaves, that chlorophyll is constantly being burned up and turned over. Um, it's not like it stays there. You have to keep remaking it so the leaves are making more of this all summer long. Now, the, the carotenoids um, have a different, a different function. And what they're doing is they are absorbing light in a different um, spectrum than what's been used by the chlorophyll. And you can see over here, this is what chlorophyll absorbs. It soaks up all the blue stuff and all the red stuff. So the color that's left that's reflected back to your eye is kind of green. But what the carotenoids do is they mop up a lot of this green light that's being reflected back um, and take that, turn it into additional energy to complement the photosynthesis cycle. So that's the first thing they do is they actually take advantage of different light spectra to make photosynthesis even more efficient. In addition to that, these carotenoids have a, a special process that allows them to avoid um, burning and overheating of the leaf during the summer. So when you're sitting there in July and August and it's just super hot, the reason these leaves don't completely collapse is because the carotenoids are able to shed that heat energy and keep the cells from being terribly damaged. Um, now the last group is these anthocyanins and they have a different function. And what they really do is they um, help the leaf or the plant respond especially well to injury and stress, particularly super cold events 
And they also function as a sunscreen for the, um, for the leaf system. And if you think about it, um, they are going to be absorbing all this light down here on the bottom of the spectrum, leaving just the red light over here that's reflected back when you see that red. This is ultraviolet light down here, down in the bottom. This is the real damaging stuff. And so these red uh, pigments are effectively acting as a sunscreen for the plants that are the most sensitive to those kinds of damaging um, radiation. So they all have a really cool function. One thing to realize is that when fall is happening, what you'll start off with is a green leaf. And then as the, um, uh, as the photosynthesis begins to slow down, the, the green fades away because the plant's not able to regenerate more of it. And you just start seeing the yellow pigments that have always been there. They're just beginning to show up for the first time. The red stuff, it was not there in the summer. It has to be synthesized by the leaf for those plants that are able to do it. And that starts, you know, late, like in the late summer in August and moves into the early fall. And it requires a lot of sunlight to generate this red, this red pigment. So you'll notice where there's a lot of sun and it's been a really bright, sunny summer and a, a sunny fall with cold nights, but no freeze, is when you'll get the super um, red colors. So, you know, let's, let's just talk about a couple of the reds and yellows that you see as you're wandering around. And, you know, I went down to Laurel Knob and just started picking up leaves off the ground. So the maples are, are an incredible group of plants. And, you know, what you see here on the right is a sugar maple, and what's on the left is a red maple. And you'll notice the red maple is not red. <laughs> it's yellow, and that's because it, it hasn't generated much of that red pigment yet, except right here on this tip. You can see it starting here on the tip and sort of down around this edge. But this leaf fell off before it really had a chance to create any of those anthracyanin pigments. So the difference between the sugar and the red is you can see the red maples have these jagged teeth along the edges, whereas the sugar maple's edge is very smooth like that. And that's how you can tell them apart. But we in Lonesome Valley have multiple different species of maples, so we're getting a ton of different coloration from them. Now, if you set the maples to, to the corner and you think about another kind of yellow gold is this birch. And the birches have this kind of beautiful lance shape with a little point. But you look at this feathering or these fine double edged teeth that go down the edge of the birch is how you tell them. And these trees are the ones that you may remember we talked about in the summer. Their root system is really great at capturing uh, nutrition from virtually nothing like the top of a rock. And you'll see them mostly around, you know, streams and moist areas in Lonesome Valley. We have five different species of birch here in the valley, um, but they are also one of the big um, yellow and gold, um, you know, show-offs during the fall. Then you put the birch aside and you come and you see a lot of these gold, and these are the hickories. And this one is just beginning to turn. You can see that the green is starting to fade out and go into the yellow. The, the yellows are beginning to just show up. Now we're looking from the underside of this leaf, and when you ever you pick up a leaf, you know, if you flip it over and look at the top of it, one side is a lot brighter, and that's the top of the leaf where the sunlight really hits it directly. The underside of the leaf tends to be a little um, kind of duller, or more ground glass looking, because that's where all the pores are, where the leaf is breathing in and out and exchanging, you know, oxygen and carbon dioxide and all that. But the hickories, uh, we have multiple kinds of hickories here in Lonesome Valley, uh, different species that all tend to share in that golden uh, sort of color. And they provide, obviously, an incredible food source um, for many of the animal species in Lonesome Valley. Um, another kind of show-off in the yellow category is sassafras. And you've probably seen these along the road edges and stuff. Um, they, are, they grow in clones, so you may see multiple sassafras trees or smaller um, uh, trees together. They have this, um, you know, this kind of a glove shape, almost looks like little fingers on the lobes of the tree. But the thing to remember is not all the leaves have to do this. You'll see this leaf up here has just got the sort of oval shape to it. And this one down in the background has got one thumb. It looks like a mitten, you know, with a thumb uh, for it. So um, based on the age of the tree, the younger ones have more of these lobes like this. And the older they get, the less uh, lobes that you see. Um, so you'll see some of that, you know, color with the sassafras. Now, if you go um, 
to the hickories, and I mean, sorry, from, from the hickories to the oaks, we get a lot of different reds that come from the oaks. And we have two particular here in the valley that we have a lot of. On the left, you have this northern red oak, and on the right, you have this scarlet oak. Um, the difference, if you look at the scarlet, it's a very narrow leaf with these big, wide sinuses. But the colors in the scarlet, you have this anthocyanin being generated, but it's a very deep um, red color, which tells you that it's absorbing much more of the light spectrum. Um, over here, this is a northern red oak that gives you that really bright red color. And you can see on this leaf, you've got sections of the leaf that have had, for just because of the way the light filters through the um, tree, has had more sun exposure in one quadrant of the leaf that has triggered this change to start happening. But eventually the whole leaf will get there. Um, the northern red oaks are one of the most variable that we have in terms of the leaf shape and the kind of colors that you get with these guys. But they may be yellow, they may be all sorts of colors. But remember that the, um, the acorns that these um, trees are creating are critical food sources for lots of the animals in the valley. And then, of course, we've got our sourwoods. And you're used to seeing, you know, the cool um, tassels of the flower um, uh, leftovers that are hanging on the top of the tree in the fall. The sourwood, this beautiful um, red leaf with this kind of very, very fine toothed edge to it. Um, these things are one of the first things to turn and they hold on the tree for a long time. So they'll, they'll be one of the, the faithful red colors throughout the year, and they're famous for honey. If you can ever get sourwood honey, you'll never forget it. Um, another kind of show off, and actually even a brighter red, is the black gum. Um, and similar kind of leaf shape um, to the sourwood, but the thing about a black gum, it has these sort of curling tips on the leaf uh, tip edge, and this uh, petiole or the stem has this kind of art shape to it. Um, the, the black gum trees um, are all over the valley. They're early changing um, color. It's an interesting uh, tree. The, the wood has um, interlacing grain to it, so you can't really split it. Um, but it's one of our big uh, red fall colors. And then, of course, um, we're back to the maples again. You remember we started with... Um, you know, yellow colors, and you'll see a lot of the red um, maples that come up. And just remember, from a maple perspective, they can run the whole spectrum. Um, <clears throat> but if you're looking up at a tree, you know, be sure you know what you're looking at, because you might look up in the sky and, you'd, you you know, you'd have to look at these leaves carefully. These could be two maples, or it turns out this one up here, this red and orange is an actually a red maple. This one over here is actually a birch. Um, so you have to get looking at the leaves very closely and before you kind of make a flash identification. Um, but remember that these maples um, come in a bunch of different colors. Um, and they're, um, particularly the sugar maples, are tending to grow only around, you know, 3,500 feet and above. So you won't see them down deep in the valley mostly. You'll see them up a little bit higher unless they've been artificially planted. So that's kind of a quick overview of how the colors come to be, what they mean. When you look at these leaves of different colors, you know that they're doing different jobs in terms of different light absorption or protecting uh, certain parts of the plant from ultraviolet radiation and damage from temperature and stuff. So it helps you understand how the trees uh, survive through the course of their life cycle. Now, then we, we have these incredible birds in the valley. Uh, hopefully you've seen some of them, but you don't get many looks, the uh, pileated woodpeckers. And Leah and I had um, a pair of them that were, for some reason, I think they were getting their cavities made for the, um, for the winter, but there was a, a pair that was just frantic around our house for about three weeks. I was not able to get these pictures. I stole the pictures off the internet. The rest of them, these are mine, but not these woodpecker pictures. Uh, they're just too fast. But, but you'll see them, and they're incredible birds. So what about these guys? They are the largest woodpecker, you know, in North America. They don't migrate. Um, so you're going to see them, and you'll especially see them in the wintertime. Uh, they're very reclu reclusive, kind of shy birds, um, and they feed deep in a tree. Um, so they're, the holes that you'll see that a pileated woodpecker makes have this distinctive kind of oval or almost a tall rectangular shape. And some of this is because they have to drill so deep to get down to the heartwood. What they're looking for are uh, beetles and carpenter ants that are down deep in the tree. They, they feed much further down in the, in the wood than most other 
woodpeckers and sap suckers and stuff. Um, it's kind of cool. They locate their food by listening. They have ears and they're able to actually hear the insects um, in the tree. And then they use their beak as they tap the tree like you would thump a watermelon to kind of probe up and down the tree to find the um, softest spot where the largest concentration of ants is going to be found. And that's where they drill. Um, and they're probably better at picking a good watermelon than, than we are. Um, their call is this kind of a, of a very fast, a rapid kek, 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 kind of a thing that you may hear sometime. Um, but the thing that's remarkable about these birds, besides how beautiful they are, is what they do um, from the standpoint of contributing to the forest, as well as this amazing uh, parenting um, that they show. So these pileated woodpeckers, they will mate for life. Um, once they have paired up to mate, they will not separate unless one of them dies. Um, when they're getting ready to nest, they excavate a cavity that's one or two feet deep in size down in the hollow. So this is why, you know, they need big snags and dead trees to, to live in. Um, and they'll, they'll create this cavity, um, you know, in the summer or early fall. They'll, they'll dump all the chips out on the ground and then they'll lay their eggs in there. These cavities are actually um, an incredible asset for the entire um, forest um, community because many, many different kinds of animals, um, owls and all sorts of stuff, use these cavities throughout um, the life of the tree once it's been made. The woodpecker only uses it one time and they usually go to a different place and drill a new cavity every year for their nesting cycle but they're basically a, um, a housing project for every other animal in the valley. Um, once they lay their eggs, the crazy thing is that, um, you know, a lot of birds have to fly away and the eggs are sitting there vulnerable for other predators to go have breakfast. But the woodpeckers do not um, leave their eggs unattended. The male and female take turns and that egg is covered 99% of the time. It's extremely rare for a woodpecker pileated egg to be unattended, un, uh, unprotected. But what's really bizarre is at night, the males do all the night duty. Um, nobody knows exactly if that has to do with the female re um, recovering from generating the eggs or what's going on. But the um, day duty is split 50-50, but the males do all the nighttime childcare for the eggs at least. Um, and then um, once the egg is hatched, um, you know, and the, they're getting ready to uh, raise the little chick for about three weeks before it fledges. They may actually have a separate cavity where they move to do their, um, their fledging and the hatching part, but um, it depends on the bird. But you may have two cavities. So their life cycle is really kind of incredible. And then there's this um, flower that we have, a fall bloomer um, called the closed bottle gentian. And I don't know if you've seen this a lot. Um, it doesn't show off as much as most flowers. The color is really incredible, um, but they're kind of small and it's easy to overlook them. But there's something about these things that is pretty incredible. So if, if you see them, they're down on the ground. They're only, you know, four inches or maybe a 12 inches tall at most. You'll see the little leaves are kind of these just typical small green leaves and nothing exciting. You look at this and you first think, well, it's something that's yet to open, but this is it. This is why it's called a closed bottle, um, and it's in the gentian family. So these plants are famous for medicinal properties. Um, they've been used by the Cherokee and, and local Native um, Americans, as well as settlers, for all sorts of things, but particularly uh, anti-inflammatory and antiseptic functions, um, curing fever from all sorts of um, causes. Uh, malaria it was used. That's where it was first discovered was for the treatment of malaria. Um, it's used for liver and bowel trouble and stuff. Um, don't think it's a magic medicine. Um, it does have function, but you have to process it the right way. The roots is where all the medicinal um, power seems to live, but the roots are extremely bitter. So it's really interesting. These animals, I mean, so these um, flowers are not eaten by many animals or predators that nobody grazes on this stuff because it's not tasty. Um, but the plant is completely full of nectar um, inside the bottle, but it remains closed. So then the question is, how does it, um, you know, get pollinated and stuff? And it's a, it's, a, it's a bizarre story of pollination. 
Um, but this is what happens. So basically, there's only three or four um, uh, types of very large bumblebees that can actually open this plant that have the um, strength and the um, proboscis uh, type structure to, uh, to open the bottle. But once they do, they dive in head first and you can see this um, you know, little rear end sticking out. And, and the thing is like a, um, a cornucopia of nectar. So basically, um, it's a mutualistic association where the bee is addicted to this plant and the plant is addicted to this bee because they absolutely have to have each other to survive. So you'll see them. Uh, th these are, uh, took pictures down uh, near Meta Way. We also have some up near our house and um, kind of near Laurel Knob. And you've, I've seen them over in Wags Way. So they're scattered all over the valley. They're uh, in the fall, but you have to be kind of looking at them because uh, they're kind of small. Um, and they'll tend to be on the edges of, you know, trails and roads and stuff. Um, the last thing to touch on is the hemlocks in Lonesome Valley. And I wanted to touch on these if you haven't noticed them because they're just an incredible majestic uh, plant, but these trees are also really critical for environment. And you, many of you know about the infestation that's been killing these trees over the last uh, two, three decades. Um, but I just want to touch on this. So that's uh, Richard Yao hugging one of the hemlocks down um, at Canyon's Inn. And we are really fortunate here to still have three or four groves of large and very healthy hemlocks that are still hanging on. Um, this one at the bottom is the one is a, one of them that's kind of over near the wood pile, um, kind of on the west side of the, uh, of the valley. But basically, it's important to know what these hemlocks are doing to the ecosystem and to this canyon. Um, you, you're probably familiar with their, their needle structure. You know, they have these little rows, two little rows of needles. Um, but you'll start to see them looking kind of shaggy um, from the early infestation of the adelgid. And these are some of the hemlocks groves down in um, Canyon's Inn that Richard was hugging. And you'll notice these trees, the upper two thirds of the tree has still got a lot of needle structure, but it's not nearly as dense as this one that I showed you that came from the west side of the canyon, this one in the bottom of the picture. If you compare that tree to these, you'll notice that their lower part of the tree is starting to thin out pretty um, dramatically. So we're going to talk about what's going on here. These trees are absolutely iconic for North Carolina. Um, there are two species actually here. There's, uh, there's the eastern hemlock that's all over the eastern United States, and then there is the Carolina hemlock that's only really localized to Western North Carolina is the only place where it lives. Um, these hemlocks are, of, are what's called a foundation species. They basically create the entire microclimate around where they live. They, they drive the food web down in the soil. We talked about photosynthesis and the sugars and all that stuff. But they basically create a very unique um, food web in the soil and in the um, canopy they have a, a very important cooling effect on the microclimate uh, year round. Um, and they create what's called um, canopy connectivity so that um, animals um, that are low uh, ground level or very low animals as well as birds that like to be way up high, the, there's connectivity from the ground all the way to the top of these trees the way they're normally um, shell, uh, uh, structured. So they, they provide a lot of food and shelter, there's 90 species of birds that are obligate for um, hemlocks in different uh, ways. Um, they are really important for the streams and this riparian, that's a fancy word for the uh, edges of the streams, but they always live near the stream area and they're really crucial for maintaining stream health, especially critical for keeping stream temperatures. Um, they keep the streams cool. This is why we have native trout particularly the brook trout here, um, about 25 or 26% of the entire um, ground temperature control for our riparian streams in Western North Carolina is, is regulated by the hemlocks. Um, so they're really critical for that perspective. And they condition the soil. So they help control runoff, um, obviously erosion, and they filter um, critical surface and pollutants as well as the filtration that they do through their needles year round for atmospheric pollution. So their, their function is just in, incredibly uh, important. 
The threat is this um, goofy bug up here. This is a microscopic picture of, a, of an adelgid. It's an insect. It's a little tiny microscopic bug that has been killing the hemlocks uh, pretty aggressively all over the United States. It was introduced accidentally from Japan, um, you know, back in the 50s, um, came in through Richmond, Virginia, it first landed in North Carolina in 1995. But what these bugs do, they live along the uh, base of the, of the needle here, and they puncture the stem to, with this little uh, puncturing thing up here that looks like, a, literally like a needle, <laughs> that they stick in the base of this thing to feed on the nutrients, the sugars and the water that are flowing up and down. Um, and as soon as they do that, they start uh, starving uh, individually the needles and branches of the tree. Now, during the summer, this is what a, uh, this top picture, I'm holding a hemlock branch from down in Canyon's Inn. That's what the, the branches look like in the summer. Um, you don't see the woolly stuff because the um, little bugs are inert during the, I mean, they're, they're dormant during the summer. Um, but, um, you can tell generally how healthy the tree is by the number of needles that are still, you know, there and whether there's any new buds and pushing new growth in the spring. But what happens in the fall and the winter is these bugs wake up and they become most active during the winter time. They puncture all up and down these stems. They start sucking sugars out of the tree and water and the wool, this white stuff that you see, they, they form this wool around their body both to insulate them from the freezing temperatures and where they're going to lay their eggs for the next generation of these little microscopic vampires. And so over time, as they starve the needles for water and nutrition, the needles turn brown, they eventually fall off, and, and you see the trees dying gradually from the bottom upward towards the top. Um, and it usually takes, you know, four to eight years or so on average for a hemlock to succumb. So on the upper left here, you've got a picture of one of our hemlocks over on the west side of the canyon that's really very healthy looking and has great, um, you know, needle fill all the way down to the base, almost near the ground. On the right hand side, you've seen these, I'm sure, around the canyon. There's plenty of them all over North Carolina. These were taken uh, down near Canyon's Inn. Um, these trees obviously are completely dead. They've succumbed um, to the whole infestation. So we have the whole spectrum in the valley from really healthy large ones that are still left, several small um, you know, saplings and seedlings that are po popping up through the ground, but um, to many, many that have died. So, you know, obviously what we can lose is the incredible beauty of these things and their um, important functions for the health of the soil and rivers and streams around here, as well as the birds and um, amphibians um, and animals that we like to see. Um, so the good news is we have many here that we might be able to um, save by treatment. And um, as you know, um, you know, there's been a, some committees formed that we're working with the Lonesome Valley um, Board and the management to try to see if we might be able to start saving some of these over time. But as you walk through the valley, you know, enjoy them, notice them, pay attention to them and realize kind of hopefully now, what they contribute to the rivers and the, and the trail beds that we enjoy so much. So I hope you've learned some uh, cool stuff. Um, this is kind of the, the last one for the fall. I'll do one of these somewhere in the deep of the winter time because there's all kinds of crazy things to see all throughout the year. But hopefully, um, you know, between the, the, the bee and the gentian and the woodpeckers and the fall t um, color change and how all this is sustaining uh, the web of life here, um, you found something interesting. So hope you have a great uh, summer and uh, sorry, great fall and uh, we'll talk again soon. Bye-bye.